Yep, good morning. So last time we talked about the disk access model, aka external memory model. And there, the goal was to minimize IOs, where we assume that there's an infinite disk and there's memory that's bounded. Memory has size m, but it's divided into m over b pages, each which can hold a block of size b. And um, today, we're going to continue with trying to minimize IOs. Um, but we're going to look at something called the cache oblivious model, or actually, um, yeah, cache oblivious model. Okay, and the idea here is, well, it's it's like the DAM model, except there are two differences. The first difference is that the algorithm is not allowed to know the parameters of the system, like M or B. Okay, so B trees, B is hard coded into the into a B tree. Um, and the second thing is that the algorithm doesn't control the cache replacement policy. Meaning, so when we're in the DAM model, we said things like, okay, so I'll read in this block, then I'll evict that block, et cetera. We assumed we had full control over the machine. Uh, in the cache oblivious model, we assume that the operating system handles all of that. Okay, it handles what gets evicted and what doesn't. And we assume that it makes optimal choices. So in our analysis, we're going to assume that we're evicting what we want to evict. Okay. Um, but in reality, it's the operating system that's doing the choices. And we're assuming that it, it makes the optimal choices. So in particular, it makes choices that are at least as good as the ones that we assume in the analysis. OK? So we won't change any practice what we do. So we'll just assume like, any specific set of choices we make will lower bounds how good things are. Any, right. So uh, yeah. So things can only be better than what we say in our analysis, because we're in our analysis, we're going to assume a particular choice of evictions, but the OS does you know, the optimal evictions. OK, so um, first a couple words about this. Um, you know, why, why the cache oblivious model? So okay, one, one thing is just, uh, um, well, easily, it's easily portable across machines. You don't have to like, fine tune parameters in your code on a per machine basis. Um, remember what I remember why we have B in the first place. B, the block size, was chosen to amortize against the expensive cost of seeking on disk. Right? Once you seek, which costs you a lot, you might as well read B things to amortize against that. Um, so in, in reality, there's um, this B is not really even a fixed thing because even on a, even on a given disk, like the disk is a is a disk, right? And then Kind of depending on whether things are written on the outside of the disk or toward the center of the disk, it affects kind of what the effective B should be to get the same level of amortization. Another thing is your code might actually be running on a machine that's also running lots of other processes at the same time, right? So the effective M that's allocated to your code's process might change over time. So kind of the, the M that you're using in your code should change over time depending on the, you know, the current uh, situation. But if your, code, if your code doesn't know M or B, but your bounds depend on M, over M and B, then they're effectively using the best block size and memory that's actually available at any given time. Okay, so they're robust as um, system environment changes. Another thing, too, is there are multiple levels of memory hierarchy. right? So there's disk, there's RAM, there's L3, L2, L1 cache. Um, and each one has its own you know, different effective M with different parameters. So the bounds that you're proving kind of hold against any adjacent levels of the hierarchy at the same time. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what I want to say about the justification for cache oblivious algorithms. Now, you might look at two and say this is not realistic. right? How can the operating system know the optimal choices? In particular, the optimal choices depend on things that our algorithm might do in the future. right? Because what should you evict? You should evict something that the algorithm is not going to use anytime in, in the like anytime in the near future. But for the operating system to know that, it has to know the future, which it doesn't. OK. So I want to actually claim that um, item two is actually not really an idealized assumption. It's actually perfectly fine to assume that the operating system knows the future. And the reason for that is related to um, something in the world of online algorithms. So I'm just going to do a brief detour into online algorithms to justify, to justify this optimal choices from the operating system. And then once I do that justification, we'll start actually seeing some algorithms in this model. 
Uh, before I do that justification, you know, just let's just uh, make sure we, you know this is not crazy that we can actually develop algorithms that have I/O complexity depending on B and M, even though we don't know them. So we we already saw one last lecture actually, which was scanning an array. Okay. So even if you don't know B, you can store your elements in a contiguous array. And then if you scan the array, your I.O. complexity is like n, n over b, right? 1 plus n over b, let's say. Um, so there's a bound that depends on b, but the code doesn't need to know b. But it turns out you can do, oh, you look puzzled. Wasn't the algorithm that we were going to read in sequentially the elements of the array at a time? Oh, the algorithm can just be a for loop, right? Okay. Now, just for i equals 1 to n, like read ai. Because, um, I mean, that has the same effect, right? Like when you read in the first element of that block, mm -hmm. the block will be read into memory. And then the future reads you do in that block oh, okay. will already be in memory. Okay. So you don't even need to explicitly. So there's an explicit assumption that when you read from AI, it's in memory already and it reads memory. And then from this, you read it in the next like, few things that read it is going on. That's right, yeah. So, there's, yeah, so that, that's the assumption is if, if, if an item you read is in memory, you read it for free. If it's not in memory, then you fetch it and the, the, the whole block that contains it, and you bring that into memory. That's right. So even, even last time, we had that assumption. OK, great. So we're, we've already seen one catchable abuse algorithm. It's going to turn out you can do crazier things than, than scanning arrays. Um, but actually, a lot of the algorithms hinge upon this observation that scanning arrays is n over vios. And then it's cleverly arranging things in contiguous portions so that you get this kind of good behavior. <clears throat> okay, so um, I want to justify item two. So I have to talk about online algorithms. So I apologize for anyone who took CS224. So, you know, we spent two or three lectures on this, but um, I just want to make sure. I don't assume that you've been in 224, so I'll, I'll just tell you what you need to know. I won't actually spend too much time on it. So the idea in, an online, in online algorithms is you have a sequence of events. And after each event must make an irreversible decision. So um, I'll, I'll show you soon how that's related to our situation. Well, the irreversible decision, I guess, is obvious: is what should I evict from cash, right? And um, but okay, so <clears throat> or evict from memory. But so the canonical, you know, example of an online problem is the ski rental problem. So wait, who's heard of? Have any of you heard of ski rental? It's, it was in two two four. So maybe you've seen ski rental. So. In ski rental, the idea is this. Um, okay, you and your friends are on, a, on vacation at a ski resort. Okay? Um, you and your friends also don't have jobs, but you have a lot of money, so that's okay. You, you, you're willing to take long vacations. And since you don't have jobs, um, your vacation can be as long as, as uh, you want it to be, OK? And, and you yourself have no preference for how long the vacation is, so you let your friends decide. So every morning, you wake up at the ski resort, and you ask your friends, uh, do you want to continue skiing you know, today, or should we, all, should we all just go home and end the vacation? So, and your friends will tell you either, yes, let's keep skiing, or no, I'm ready to go home. So each day. Friends say, you know, continue skiing. And the other thing they can say is, we're done. Let's go home. Okay. Now, in order to ski, you need skis. Okay. So there are two options. Option one is you buy skis. Okay.
and that costs you 10 bucks. And the store, unfortunately, has no refunds, no refund policy. Renting skis, on the other hand, costs you $1. So every day you hear their decision, continue skiing or we're done. Obviously, if we're done, you don't have to do anything. You just go home. But if they say continue skiing, now you have a decision to make. Are you going to buy the skis or are you going to rent the skis today? And of course, once you buy them, you don't have to do any. In the future, you can just keep using the ones you bought. Okay. So um, what's our goal here to make, you know, what's guiding our decision? We want to minimize. We want to minimize the worst case ratio between the amount of money we spend versus the amount of money spent by an omniscient being who knows exactly when our friends want to go home. So we want to minimize cost ratio versus omniscient being who knows the future. And um, this thing is called, this cost ratio is, is called, this worst case cost ratio is called the competitive ratio of our algorithm. Okay. So, you know, what's one strategy? One strategy we could do over here is um, on day one of skiing, we just buy skis and then that's it. We never need to, we never need to spend more than $10. But of course, the worst case scenario is that Day two, they wake up and say, OK, one day of skiing is enough. We want to go home. You spent $10, but the omniscient being knew that they only wanted to ski one day. So he only rented, and then he paid $1. So that's a ratio of 10. And as you can imagine, as this 10 gets bigger, let's imagine 10 is 1,000, then your ratio is just terrible. Okay. Um, so the better thing to do is wait nine days. The first nine days, you just rent every day. And then on the 10th day, if they still want to ski, then you finally buy. Okay. So the opt cost, let's, so let's say let D equal number of days skiing. And then opt is going to be equal to um, D. Well, actually, opt is just equal to the min of D and 10, basically. This is what the omniscient being would pay. Okay, and what we're going to do is uh, rent the first nine days, buy on day ten. And what's the worst case now? Well, if we actually, if our friends actually want to ski for less than ten days, we pay nine dollars and. Opt would have also paid nine dollars, so we're doing the best that's possible. On the other hand, if they, if after day ten they want to go home, well, actually, okay, let's say this: the worst case actually is that we ski for exactly ten days, right? Then Opt knew that, and he would have just bought the skis on day one, whereas we're paying nineteen dollars. So, worst case ratio is one point nine. So that's the competitive ratio of this particular algorithm, the algorithm which waits nine days, I mean, which rents nine days and buys on the 10th. Um, it turns out, actually, that if you allow randomness in your, in your decision making, so in particular, um, your friends, so you're, you're allowed to use randomness in your decision making, and your friends don't know the random bits that you, that you generated. OK, let's assume that, which I think is reasonable. Um, you can actually get an expected, expected competitive ratio of something like e over e minus 1, which is, which, so this thing is like converges to 2 as 10 goes to infinity, right? In general, if this is b, do if this is b dollars, you, you buy on the bth day. But there's, there's a scheme which um, is never worse than e over e minus 1 for any b, for any uh, value, uh, cost of buying, a randomized algorithm. And actually, provably, I think, Provably, deterministically, you can't beat 2 or as, as b goes to infinity. Well, you can't really beat this. I think it's kind of obvious to see why you can't beat this deterministically. And randomized, I believe it's also true that you can't beat um, 
the other scheme, which I'm not going to talk about today. But anyway, so that's, that's what online algorithms are about. How does that now apply to our problem? Um, there's the paging problem, which theoretically, which, you know, uh, had kind of rigorous analyses of things, had good theoretical understanding from this paper of Slater and Tarjan in 85. Okay. Now, what's the paging problem? Memory holds k, which is equal to, in our case, m over b pages. And there's a sequence of page access requests. Okay. So someone says, I want, I want to read from page 1, I want to read from page 5, and they give you a sequence of pages that they want to read and write. And it's just like the DAM model we've seen. If the page is in memory, you can, you can freely, a page is like a block now. If the page is in memory, then you can access it for free. If it's not in memory, you have to go fetch it and bring it in and possibly evict someone if memory is full. And that costs one. So it's exactly the DAM model. And now, again, you don't know the future. You don't know, you're the operating system. You don't know what the future page requests will be. You just have to serve, you just have to decide what to evict on the fly as you see requests. Okay? So anyone have a guess for what, what the optimal algorithm is, the omniscient being? If you were omniscient and you knew the future, when you had to evict, when you had to evict a page, you know, due to memory being full, what would you evict? Use the least in the future? So frequency-wise, like the one that's used least frequently in the future? The farthest away. Yeah, the farthest away in, in the, the farthest away in time in the future, right? So, so opt evicts the farthest in future in, t in terms of time. Okay. So clearly you need to know the future to do that. What's a scheme that you, know, you could actually use in a real computer, which you would learn, probably learn about in, in architecture? Things like, for example, LRU, so least recently used. or first in, first out. OK. So what are these algorithms? Least recently used looks at, so it needs to evict something. For each page in memory, it keeps track of um, when, is, when did I most recently touch this page? And the page which is furthest back in the past is the one that I prefer to evict. And first in, first out is as it sounds like. So if I look at, um, if I time, if I put a timestamp on each page as to when I first brought it in, then the oldest page is the one that I'll evict. I'll evict, okay? So what Slater and Tarjan showed That would be LRU, uh, right? It really is just when you brought it in. Okay, got yeah. Right. In fact, I mean, there's there's a simpler algorithm like called, I guess, the mark. Well, yeah, the deterministic marking algorithm, which Kind of both of these work for the same reason. Well, the theorem I'm going to say applies to both of these for almost the same reason, which is that the mark algorithm does well. And the mark algorithm is just initially all pages in memory are unmarked. Okay? Whenever I bring a page in or whenever I touch a page that's already in, I mark it. Whenever I have to evict someone, I'll evict any page that's not marked unless every page is marked. Okay? And if every page is marked, 
then what I'll do is I'll, I think I'll evict all of them and, uh, and then bring in a page. Or I'll just, no, I'll unmark them all and then, and then evict someone and then bring in what the guy I want to bring in. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, so the mark algorithm also will satisfy this theorem. But the theorem is that LRU and FIFO are both K competitive. Which is actually kind of terrible, actually, right? A K is M over B. So what I'm telling you is that the number of IOs that I make is M over B times what opt would do. So if, if I made assumption two and I came, I came up with an IO bound of T, then if I used LRU, my IO bound would be T times M over B, which is terrible, OK? Um, however, there's also another theorem they proved which they called, they called kind of analysis with resource augmentation. LRU and FIFO are both too competitive against an omniscient being with only k over 2 sized memory. So if you assume that kind of the, the, bad, the bad case examples which, which make you, which force you to be k competitive are somewhat very careful, OK? I mean, actually, the bad example is just, um, the bad example is just, there are only k plus 1 pages in the universe. And then the, adver the, uh, adversary always, the adversary always requests the page that you don't have in cache. OK. But then if you, if you take that sequence, uh, like basically that, that same thing, um, I mean, remember opt, the omniscient being knows the future. So in particular, whatever sequence you write down, you can't kind of dynamically change things on them like that. You have to fix a sequence. And then you'll show you can show that for any such se for any sequence, um, he won't do nearly. He'll only miss a, like a one over k fraction of of requests, whereas LRU misses basically everything. Um, so anyway, yeah. So what this means is this implies that if I O complexity of my cache oblivious algorithm is you know T and M B. So if this is so if the IO complexity is this and this is equal to you know theta of of T and M over two B then assumption two is valid you know, up to, up to a constant, right? So if I, do, if I do assumption two and I assume that the operating system is using, let's say, uh, LRU, and, and, and that, let's say that memory is fully associative, which it often isn't, but um, yeah, then, uh, then algorithm two is a safe assumption, okay? So that's the justification for that assumption. Questions about anything? Okay. So let's now, now that we've talked about the model and gave some justification for this assumption, let's get into some algorithms in the cache oblivious model. So, so problems. So for example, we could look at you know array traversal or even reversal. So we already said traversal is O of 1 plus n over b, right? Traversing an array of size n is 1 plus n over b. The 1 just because in the case that n might be less than b, we have to pay at least one IO to read in the first block. And reversal 
One way to do that is just read in the array from the left and right simultaneously and just like swap as you go this way. So that's also basically the same. It's like two, two traversals, so that's also 1% of relief. Okay, so that's, that's some simple stuff. Let's move into something where last time when we came up with an algorithm, it was not cache oblivious. So for example, uh, square matrix multiplication. Let's say the matrices are n by n. So last time, so here, let's say this is a times b. We're doing matrix multiplication on a times b. Last time, break, we, bre we, break, we broke um, a and b up into like root m over 2 by root m. That root m by, yeah, so let's say root m by 2 by root m by 2 blocks. Right? So the point is that the total amount of memory that, um, I don't want to, I shouldn't say blocks, because blocks mean something for us, submatrices. And the point was, now a submatrix takes total space m over 2, right? So we can take a submatrix from A and a submatrix from B. Those combined fit in memory. Maybe, maybe I just need to adjust the constant so that we can also do some other stuff in memory, too. Um, but yeah, and then we got a complexity. We got a complexity last time, which was something like, I think it was O of n cubed over b root m, something like that, was the complexity last time. Obviously, this algorithm needs to know m. Okay. So the question is, how do you do matrix multiplication efficiently in the I/O model when you don't know m and you don't know the algorithm didn't actually need to know b last time. The b came about just because we had to like scan things in, and we we're assuming that scanning things in took time, you know, number of things you scanned in over B. But we did need to know M because that's how we chose to break up the matrices into submatrices. Okay, now we don't know these parameters. So in the CO model, Cache Oblivious, what we're going to do is we're going to look at A. It's N by N. And we're going to break it up into submatrices. And then we're going to lay out the submatrices in memory. So here we have A11, here we have A12, here we have A21, here we have A22. We lay them out contiguously in memory like this, and we do this recursively. Okay? So this is a recursive layout. So that's how, we, that's how we choose. So we can choose how things are laid out in memory. Like we can, do, we can have for loops and say, you know, for i equals 1 to n, put this here, or things like that. But we can't, but we, we can't decide um, what blocks get evicted, and we can't know what, mem what the memory size is. So that's the layout. And then what's the actual multiplication algorithm? <clears throat> Again. Uh, Divide and conquer. Recursion again. So we have we have um, you know a one one a one two etc. We also have b one one etc. And then c is equal to a times b. So that's equal to A11, B11, um, plus A12, B21. 
And then a11, b12 plus a12, b22, etc. Okay? So we're actually going to do the, we're going to do it recursively like this. Um, so you asked, won't the optimal place to stop on the recursion depend on M or B? So the, the point is, there's sort of a, there's sort, so at some level of the recursion, all these block sizes will, all these like submatrices will fit in memory, right? right? Um, but you don't know when everything's fitting in But you don't know when. But the point is, even, if, even though you recurse further than that, which we will, oh, so like, then, then you're just doing stuff in memory anyway, right? So that, that's, that's the main, that's the point here, which is you, you are recursing deeper than you need to recurse, but all the deeper levels of recursion, everything's happening within memory anyway, so you're not paying for it. Um, so if I write down, I can now write down um, a recursion. So the analysis of this. So the base case, so let's say t of n is the number of IOs. t, I guess, usually meant time, but let t now is IOs. So t of n is how many IOs uh, are, are being done here in order to multiply two n by n matrices. So the base case, this goes, this goes now to what you're saying. The point is, this is O of m over b once n is at most something like root m. Right, <clears throat> and that's the base case. And um, otherwise, t of n is something like eight times t of n over two plus o of uh, one plus n squared over b. Okay. N squared over B just because you have to like read in the output matrix and write to it, and the output matrix has size N squared. Okay. Um, good. And I'm not going to, you know, this is now an exercise. You can solve this recurrence. This becomes something like O of uh, N squared over B plus N cubed over B root M, which is exactly what we got last time. Okay. In particular, um, I'm assuming that, so if you make the assumption that n is bigger than m, right, otherwise everything fits in memory, then this is n squared over b times n over root m. And n over root m is bigger than 1 because n over m is bigger than 1. So this is equal to n cubed. This term dominates that term, n cubed over b root m for n bigger than m, and in fact, bigger than root m. Yeah? So I can not understand the purpose of the COBS. Not purpose of COBS. I just don't really understand how it works. So like, in this recursion, how do we know we are at the best case? We don't. Then we just recurse forever, and then we, we don't know. So, so the point is, yeah, so the point is, once we have submatrices that Fit in like that fit inside of memory. Okay, then we're gonna do a bunch of stuff. We're gonna like you know keep recursing, keep recursing, keep recursing, and then we're gonna like read all this stuff in. But in reality, everything here fits in memory, so we only pay like we only really pay for a linear scan to read this stuff in. Like if you analyze all these deeper levels of recursion, you know we're reading. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Everything's happening in memory. So the only payment is actually bringing it into memory. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. okay. So that's matrix multiplication. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, another, another thing we can look at, again, is uh, linked lists. So remember the problem that, that we wanted to solve last time. So linked lists are a data structure. They solve a particular problem. The problem we want to solve um, is a data structural problem that supports three operations, insertion, deletion, and traversal. Okay, so um, we want to support insert some, we want to insert some item X after the item that's pointed to by pointer P. We want to delete something that's pointed to by P. And we also want to traverse the K elements that follow the element at pointer P, or K. Just like last time. And if you remember the solution from last time, what we did is we like uh, partitioned the linked list nodes into these groups of size theta b each, okay? And the idea there was as we traverse through the linked list, there's, there's at least b over two elements in each group of, of, uh, of nodes, so we only pay kind of amortized one over b for traversal. Okay. The issue is we don't know b now, so we can't do that. Okay, so we're gonna do something else. Um, oh, and did I? I don't. Wait, sorry, say it again. I mean, each time we build we from a frog, right? So, I mean, yeah, so our, our interface is just we can ask to read items at a. We don't read blocks in our code. Our code is the code that you're familiar with writing, which is we just ask to read an address. Okay, and then the operating system knows whether or not the thing stored at the address is actually in memory or whether it's being stored in disk. And it does things behind the hood to make sure that it's in memory and then gives us the value. But like, we, we're oblivious to all of that. All we know is we asked to read what's in the address and we got an answer. Okay. All we know is we allocated an array of size 10 billion and we read the 50th element and we got, we got it, okay, or wrote it and it's written. Um, behind the scenes, the operating system is, is doing stuff, but we're oblivious. I don't remember if I said it, so I hope I did. If I didn't, maybe I should uh, say kind of who, who introduced the notion of cache oblivious algorithms. Did I, did I forget to mention that? If I did, uh, I should mention, I'll just mention it now. So cache oblivious algorithms, kind of this, this whole model was introduced in a paper by um, uh, Frigo, Lyserson, Prokop, and Ramachandran. This is in Fox 99. And um, a lot, I guess many of these algorithms and data structures that I'm mentioning, unless I say otherwise, were also introduced in that paper. There's also a survey that came out after uh, by Eric Demain in O2. The name of the survey is Cache Oblivious Algorithms and Data Structures. Okay, so it's easy to find the survey. Um, Good. So now back to linked lists. So how do we do this cache obliviously? Okay. So insertion. So okay. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to store all the nodes in an array. When we do insertion, what we're going to do is, <clears throat> oh, and, and insertion actually there comes with a pointer too, which tells us we should insert element x after element p. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, store x at the end of the array. And adjust pointers 
So in particular now, the element at p has its next pointer pointing to x. Okay. Let's say we even maintain it as a doubly linked list. So we'll, we'll update x's predecessor to be p and et cetera. We'll, we'll maintain it as a linked list. So how many IOs is this? Yeah, so it's O of 1 IOs. It's a constant, let's say. Okay. Which last time is what also, also what we got, right? Last time we also got O of 1 IOs. Deletion. We're not actually going to delete anything. We're just going to go to P, and then we're going to flip a bit a mark bit that says it's deleted. So we're just going to mark p as deleted. Okay. <coughs> so, so far, we're not doing anything intelligent at all, right? I mean, this looks a lot like implementing a, just a normal linked list. But then now what we want is we want traversal we want traversal to be something like 1 plus k over b ios. If you traverse k elements, then that's the complexity. So how do we do that? Traverse uh, uh, p k. So there's really not much we can do at first. We go to p. And we follow, the, we follow the next pointer k times, and we just read those k elements. Okay, That's just like a normal linked list. But then we do something extra at the end, which is we take all those k elements that we just read and rewrite them at the end of the array contiguously. Okay, So, so read the k elements just by following pointers. Then rewrite them all contiguously at the end of the array. And then mark their old locations as being deleted. So the picture looks something like this. Here's the array. We asked to traverse from here. So who knows where things are? It might go here. That's the next thing. It might go here. That's the next thing. Um, and then it might go here. And then it might go here. And then it might go here. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff. So the elements we visited in order are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then that's going to be turned into basically the same thing. So now we're just going to mark these items all as being deleted. And then at the end of memory, we're going to rewrite those items. We're going to rewrite them as we're going to put item 1 here, item 2 here, 3 here. Like that. So in particular, the next time someone wants to traverse those elements, it's already contiguous. Okay. <clears throat> and what we're going to argue now is claim. The amortized, oh, and I should also say another thing. If you really pay attention to what we're doing in this data structure, kind of we're, we're using a lot of mem we're using a lot of space. There are only n elements, but we keep like marking things as deleted, but not actually deleting them and moving things to the end. So over time, we might use way more space than the total number of items. So we also do the following. After every 
n operations and traverse counts as k operations, by the way. We rewrite Oh, um, I'm going to modify traverse in a second. Okay. Uh, do I need to do that? No, I don't, I don't even need to do that. No, no, this is fine. So after every n operations, where traverse counts as k operations, we rewrite the entire data structure to a new contiguous array. And we like free the old one. We delete it. We tell the operating system we don't need this old array anymore. Okay. So, in particular, at the beginning of a phase, phase means where we rewrote, we rewrote the entire data structure. Now we observe what n is. Notice that after n new operations, we at most double the amount of space we're using. So we're still, we're always, we're never using, I mean, if you want to be a little more careful, um, kind of from those n operations, kind of n minus 1 could have been deletes. So there could be a moment in time where we only have one item, but we're using n space or something. So make this n over 2. So after n over 2 operations, if we started with n at the beginning of the phase, we still have at least n over 2 items. And we're using at most 2n space. So at any point in time, we're never using more than big O of n space, where n is the current n. Okay. Um, and furthermore, by an amortization argument, this only it increases the amortized complexity of each operation. By O of 1 over B. Right? So, talk, speaking of money as we did last time, kind of every time there's an operation, I'll, I'll, I'll charge that operation some money. That operation will increase my bank account by 1 over B. Okay? Um, that inc so, so, you know, me charging that money is costing an extra 1 over B per operation now. But whenever this time comes around, my bank account has at least N over B dollars in it. And I can afford to rewrite these n elements because writing n elements costs n over b. You look like you have a question, or? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm yeah, that's right. So I'm imagining that we actually store the double links, the predecessor and the successor. Okay. Um, so that's fine. We're never using too much space because of this. So now the question is, why is traversal good? Why is traversal, why does it have low I.O. complexity in an amortized sense? Definitely it, it doesn't have low worst case complexity. But it turns out it does have good um, amortized complexity. So let's look really at, at what's going on when we do um, let's go, when we do a traversal. So because because every time we do a traversal, things are contiguous at the end, right? Um, some of these things that we read in, will, you know, will might be contiguous from like previous cleanup operations that we did, but then over time they got fragmented because people started deleting stuff. People traversed a subset of this and moved it over. So we have these like runs, these contiguous runs. So for example, 1, 2, 3 was in a row. And then 4 was by itself. And then 5 was by itself. And then 6 was by itself. So here we had a total of four runs. 1, 2, 3 was one run. 4 was a run. 5 was a run. 6 was a run. OK, so, so for traversal, we have our runs. So the actual I.O. complexity is something like O of R plus K over B I.O.s. Okay. 
But other than the first run, right, the fact, so th the fact that we have more than one run means that things got segmented, right? But how did that segmentation happen? That segmentation happened because of a previous operation, right? It happened because of a previous traversal or that made us move things over or a previous delete or a previous, um, yeah, a previous operation, okay? So what we're going to do is, <clears throat> so other than the first run, other runs were caused each other run, each other run was caused by a specific operation in the past. Okay. So we're going to charge that operation. Okay. So actually, what I'm going to do is, for each operation, like a traverse or a delete or insert, if it's an insert, let's say, in addition to the actual two or whatever IOs it does, I'm going to charge it an additional two. One of those two will be used to help pay for this. And then the other one will be used to pay whenever a run wants to charge it. Whenever this situation arises, he'll pay for it at that time. Same thing for delete. And then for traverse, for each of the k elements, I'm going to give them, I'm going to charge them one over b money. And then I'm also going to charge the traverse operation itself an extra one money. So that k over b money is going to help me pay for this. And that extra one money is, again, going to help me pay for the run that it caused. And in this way, an operation is only ever charged once for a future run. Why is it only charged once? Because after we read this in, we're going to make it all contiguous again at the end of the array. right? So for it to become segmented again, it has to be caused by another future operation. So an operation is only charged once for the run it causes. And then it's never charged again for that run. Okay, So we'll charge. those r minus 1 runs to the past operations. So they're paid for. So this implies that the amortized complexity is O of 1 plus k over b. Okay. Um, I should mention that it is possible to get worst case bounds in the cache oblivious model for linked lists. Um, and you can, if you want to look at that, you can see this paper. So it's um, <clears throat> Bender Cole, Bender Cole, Domain, Farage Colton, and Zito. And that was in um, ESA 02 for a worst case data, for something that gets worst case bounds for worst case. No, I mean, the point is to get something better than that. Yeah, so it's not going to be this data structure. It's a different type of data structure. Yeah. OK. Good. So now let's get into something that maybe even seems a little more magical, magical uh, which is for predecessor. Static predecessor. Okay. What solved that in the DAM model? B trees. Okay. So for static, for static cache oblivious B trees, um, even in that paper, it was already presented how to do it. So it turns out you can get log base B of n without knowing B. OK? So how do you get log base B of n IOs without knowing B? It's the same kind of concept as this, where you use recursion to, rec to lay out stuff in memory. So, so there are static cache oblivious B trees. 
And it uses something called the, what they call the uh, Van M. de Boas layout. Usually this is, they say VEB. Okay, this is um, a data structure that's used for predecessor and first pass predecessor and word RAM, but it turns out that kind of the way the data structure is laid out is helpful for cache oblivious, the cache oblivious model. And the idea is just this. So you have this, you build a perfect binary search tree. Like a perfect binary tree. And then what you do is you conceptually now break it up into these subtrees. Okay, where this height is a half log n. So this height is a half log n. Okay. And then you call these trees, let's give them names, t0, t1, up until, well, <clears throat> how many, if you go down a half log n levels, how many nodes are at this level? It's root n. So the root n trees hanging out, hanging, hanging down here. Okay, and then now, what you do is you recursively lay out these things in memory contiguously, just like with when we're doing matrix multiplication. So now memory looks something like Okay. And then how do you actually implement a query in this in this uh, in this tree, you do the standard search in a binary search tree, right? You start at the root and you keep going left to right depending on where the item you want should be. Okay. So so great. So all you the only thing that you are doing fancier is kind of deciding how to do this memory layout, this layout of the data structure in memory, and you're doing it recursively according to this this uh, this picture over here. So now the question is, why does it get good I/O complexity? And the reason is, so analysis Okay. Now remember, the data structure doesn't know B or M, but in the analysis, we get to know B and M, right? And we get to assume that the operating system is making optimal choices for what to evict. So what we're going to do in the analysis is zoom in on the level of recursion. So these trees, they start off as size n, then root n, then n to the quarter, et cetera, right? They look like the, the, the sizes of the trees are like n to the 1 over 2 to the j for some j. So in particular, there's the first level when these trees, when these recursive trees actually fit into a single block. So zoom in on level of recursion, the coarsest level, of recursion where uh, trees fit into fit into one block. So they have size, in particular, they have size at most b. And if it's the coarsest level, that, impl that implies that that implies that the tree size is at most b. And also at least um, square root of b, right? Just because we take square roots at each level of recursion of the tree size. 
So now let's look at let's look at this this picture now. We have these little trees now. If you if you kind of zoom in on the picture at that level of recursion, we have this tree that has size at least root b. And it has these other trees hanging off of it. And all of these has, have size like root b. This is just the analysis, of course. The data structure doesn't know this. But and what are we doing? We're executing our search just as in a normal binary search tree. So we start at the root, and we follow some path, right? That goes down, that goes down, and finally hits somewhere. So, um, right? And the point is, because of the way that we do our recursive layout over here. <clears throat> these, the nodes in this tree are contiguous in memory. The nodes in all of these little trees are contiguous in memory, right? Which means that we can read in one of these little trees in at most two IOs, right? Two IOs because we don't know, it might not start at the beginning of a block. We don't know where the blocks start and end. It might straddle a block. But each one of these can be read in, in two IOs. And then how many trees do we have to go down before we get down to the bottom? Well. The height of this tree is log n, right? The height of one of these little trees is log of root b, which is a half log b, right? So implies the total number of IOs is at most, <coughs> well, we said two IOs per each of these little trees. So two times log n over a half log b, which is the same thing as 4 times the log base b of n. Okay. So we're getting kind of b-tree-like complexity, even though we don't know b. Okay. And I think maybe I'll have time for just one more one more uh, algorithm, and this, this one is a little bit of, is going to be even maybe the most involved of the ones we've seen so far. <clears throat> so this is going to be sorting. Okay. So, <clears throat> The original cache oblivious sorting algorithm was funnel sort. And that's, that's even in, the, in that paper, the Frigo, Lyserson, Prokop, et cetera. So it was later simplified. Um, <clears throat> oh, and I should mention, uh, do I have space to write it? Notice this is a static B tree. It doesn't support insertions and deletions. You can actually get a dynamic B tree that does support them still with log base B of n IOs per operation. That's a, that's a, a, bit, a little more involved. So um, you can get a dynamic B tree with the right number of operations. And that was uh, due to uh, Bender Domain and uh, Farage Colton. This is, I think, in SciComp 05, maybe. <clears throat> yeah. If you want to go look at that. And actually, after that paper, there were other ways people came up with of doing it. So there are different approaches that get the same dynamic B-tree complexity. So OK, now back to sorting. So there's funnel sort. And then later, that was simplified. And there was this uh, lazy funnel sort, which is what I'm actually going to cover today, which is also covered in domain survey, the O2 survey that I mentioned. And that's due to uh, Brodel, uh, Fagerberg, and Jacob. This is SOTA 06. 
Sorry, oh, two, I'm sorry. That's what we're going to cover today. So remember in the dam model, we did an m over b way merge sort. So it needed to know both parameters, m and b. And we got the complexity, um, which was something like n over b log base m over b of n over b ios. And that's what we're going to shoot for now. Unfortunately, even though we don't know We don't know M and B. In the analysis, we're going to make one assumption called the tall cache assumption. We're going to assume that M is at least B squared in the analysis. And that's actually, a, well, you can relax it a little bit, but you actually need to make some form of tall cache assumption provably. So let me, let me just write that down. We make. Uh, This tall cache assumption namely that M is at least B squared. Okay. This can be relaxed to uh, M is at least b to the 1 plus gamma. And you can put a constant here, too. I mean, it's at least omega that. For, any, for an arbitrarily small gamma that you want. So you can, you can assume that m is at least b to the 1.01. .01. That's fine. But you need to assume that m is polynomially larger than b in this analysis. And in fact, there was a paper by Brodel and Fagerberg in stock 2003, which showed that if you want to achieve this complexity in the cache oblivious model, the tall cache assumption is necessary. You need to assume that m is polynomially larger than b. Otherwise, it's impossible to actually achieve this bound. Okay, so they say that tall cache assumption is necessary. to achieve star. Um, example problems where you, even with the tall cache assumption, you just can't achieve the same as the dam model. Um, actually, did I know an example? There is, I know, okay, so I definitely know an example that says that, I believe it's in, I don't know, if, I can't remember if it's in sorting or if it's in predecessor, that the constant factor has to get worse. Like there's an example of a problem where you, like the constant that you can achieve with, um, the dam model, it might even be B trees. The constant you achieve in the dam model can't be achieved in the cache oblivious model. Um, one where you don't even get similar asymptotic complexity. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. OK, so now the question is, how, what is lazy funnel sort? So um, it relies on a, a subroutine or a data, you could say a data structure called a K funnel. So definition.
Um, all these chalks are not quite broken in. Let me try this. So a K funnel, so K is a parameter, is a data structure which takes k lists as input, sorted lists, as input, having at most having at most uh, k cubed items total. And merges them. The total. If you add up the total, the total sizes across all the lists, it's going to be so. In particular, like k squared per list or something like that. Okay, and this we're going to let's just assume for now. Well, then we're going to show. I'm going to discuss how to actually do it. This can be implemented. to use k squared space and um, O of k cubed over b times log base m over b, k cubed over b plus k ios. Let's just assume that's true. And then I'll tell you how to actually implement the k-funnel. But let's say we have a k-funnel. So one way, one way to sort using a k-funnel is to just set k to be n, right? And then just feed each element as an input to the k-funnel. And then it'll spit out the it'll spit out the sorted order, right? Because each list is now a list of size one, so it's definitely sorted. The issue with that is, of course, the I/O complexity is something like k cubed, and I don't want to deal with that. There's the other issue, which is that a k funnel takes k squared space, which means we would be using n squared space to sort n numbers. So what we're going to actually do, because of this k cubed business, is the following. So we have our array A. Which has size n. And we're going to break it up into blobs, uh, each of size n to the uh, 2 thirds. Okay. So now the number of groups we have is we have k equals n to the 1 third groups. And what we're going to do is, for each group, we'll recursively sort it, the group. And then what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to merge the groups using a k-funnel. So now, what's the um, what's the I/O complexity of this? Again, we can say, look, T of n. Our base case, we can say, is when n is b squared. So O of b when n is at most b squared. Why? Because if we have b squared elements. We can read them in to memory. That takes b squared over b. That's BIOs. And now they fit in memory. They fit in memory because we have a tall cache, right? m is at least b squared, so we can actually hold everything in memory. Otherwise, we have this recurrence, which is something like um, 
n to the 1 third times t of n to the 2 thirds. I'll use, uh, let's see, n to the 2 thirds. <coughs> Plus, and then we use that k funnel complexity that's over there, but k is now cube root of n. So that becomes plus O of n over b log base m over b of n over b plus n to the one third. Now note that in the above, if n is at, if, if the original n is less than or equal to b squared, then we only use, we only, well, that could really be like n over b, actually. So maybe I'll write this, this should really be n over b, let's say. So if the original n is less, is less than b squared, we're only doing n over bios. Um, if it's bigger than b squared, then If n is bigger than b squared, then using the tall cache assumption, it's not too hard to convince yourself that this is actually dominated by that. Because that's n to the 1 third. n is at least b squared. So that's at least, um, that's at least root n. Well, you don't even need the tall cache assumption. That's at least root n. And that's n to the 1 third. So this dominates that. So if n is at least b squared, we get star ios, that star over there. If n is at most b squared, we get O of n over b ios. I need to break this thing in. OK. <laughs> All right, great. So now there's only five minutes left. So now the real question is, how do you actually implement a K funnel? And that's really where the work is. So how do you implement a K funnel? It's going to look a lot like the static B tree. Okay. So the way we're going to do it is This is a K funnel F. We break it up at the, at the middle. Where again, this height is going to be 1 half log k. And then we break this up into, this is going to be f0 is a root k funnel. And then we have these other root k funnels that are hanging off. This is f1, f2. F root k. These are each root k funnels. What we also do is each edge in this tree stores a buffer. So these things have buffers on them. And if you look at the edges that cross between F0 and each of the other trees, these buffers, there's a buffer of size k to the 3 halves. Or, um, yep, k to the three halves. Okay. 
So in particular, the size of a buffer will depend on what level of recursion that edge crosses between a top tree and the bottom trees. And then these bottom leaves have these k lists coming in them to be merged. And then this merges them. This is like the output buffer, which I'm imagining has size k cubed to store the, the, uh, the merge lists. There's not a lot of time, so I won't be able to do this analysis thoroughly, but I'll just give you the basic idea. So first of all, the space analysis. So the space, OK, so first of all, how do you actually store this? How do you actually store this thing in memory? So the memory is going to look, look like F0 gets stored here. And then here you store the middle level buffers, like these ones that cut across the middle. And then here you store f1, f2, f root k. And of course, these are all done recursively. These are laid out recursively. And you do a space analysis. Then you say that s of k is at most, um, well, it's something like 1 plus root k, f0 plus the root k others, times s of root k, plus k squared. k squared is to store these buffers that cross the middle level. And then, and then you can, this implies that k squared is at most s of k. And if you solve the recurrence, it's at, at most some O of k squared. And how do, you do, how do you actually do the merge? To do the merge, what you do is you look at the root of this. And he has two buffers that hang off his children, that go toward his children. You look at the two elements in those, in those buffers, at the top of those buffers, and then you do a merge. Whichever one is smaller goes up next. Unless one of these is empty. If one of these buffers is empty, then so remember that the root guy himself has an output buffer he's trying to fill. So he's trying to fill his output buffer, and he's trying to do it by merging his two children buffers, the buffers to his children. If one of them is ever empty, that node that has that as an output buffer recursively tries to fill it using its two children until that recursion eventually trickles down to the leaves. And these leaves are actually the input lists, right? So there's a node that, that's like here, and there's buffers here. At some point, this buffer might want to fill itself, and then he's just going to read from this list. Okay? And by zooming in on the right level of recursion, in particular, zoom in on the level j. So look at the level where you have j funnels, where j is at most root m. It's the coarsest level where j is at most root m. You can analyze this and show that k funnels achieve the kind of complexity that I, that I said. OK. Um, so I'm, I don't have time for that. It's already 101. Uh, any questions? Yeah. And then you trickle up like by kind of like push the smaller elements up. And then like somehow. Right, so yes. So yeah, so every time you want to fill a buffer, so a node nodes want to fill their output buffers. So like the root wants to fill the final output buffer. Every time a node wants to fill a buffer, he just looks in his two buffers hanging to his children and then picks the smaller one. Unless one of these buffers is empty, then he asks that child to recursively fill his output buffer. Oh, I see. OK. OK. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that's all. I, will, I guess we have only one more lecture, which is next Tuesday. Yeah. And then project, project presentations next Thursday. And I sent an email about that this morning, I believe. So. <laughs>